Well, gee whiz. Um, I'll wait. I'll wait until these folks get in. But uh, thanks so very much for uh, inviting me up. It's great to be back in the capital city again. And um, um, well, I'm I'm looking around and I see practically a sold out crowd here, so to speak. And I'm wondering, are you sure you have the right place or the right person? Uh, again, so much uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, I, uh, through some friends of mine, which I'll talk about in a minute, I, I met Fritz Hammer, and he was the one originally who mentioned to me about, uh, would you please come up and uh, maybe make a presentation at the museum here? And we agreed that I would. And um, so we've been working on that for some time. Um, and since I've been here already, I've had the opportunity to uh, meet some folks that I hadn't met before, which is fantastic. Uh, and then there are some of my friends here. Uh, you might have heard and or seen that we have uh, recently a book was published and I have my co-author BJ Hardy Hill sitting over here and her husband Pat is here someplace as well. So Brenda, will you please stand up so that everybody can see you? This is, the, this is uh, Brenda, thanks so very much. And their two grandsons are sitting right over here. Um, Barrett and Bert. Yeah, yeah, okay, real fine. Thanks very much for, for taking time out of your schedule as well. This is summertime and you're taking time out of your schedule to come here at Big Newton. So I'm really honored. I don't know about you. You probably want to be someplace else. But uh, again, so very much appreciate you being here. Um, now, there are several ways that I normally uh, launch one of these. And... Uh, and I think today what I'm going to do is I'll speak for maybe 15, maybe 20 minutes, uh, kind of depend on how it's going. But the most important part is to uh, take questions from you, the audience. That way it allows me to know more about what you're thinking about and what you'd love to ask me than it is about me trying to tell my story. Because uh, I can go on and on and on about my service to the nation and about myself and where I live and all of those kinds of things, but you may not be interested in that. So I want to get closer to what you're interested in by having you ask questions. And if you don't have a question, now think of one while I'm chatting for the next 15 minutes or so. So there are many times that I want to get excited for a day that I live down in Bluffton, down in the low country. So if I, you know, maybe feeling down a little bit on a morning that I wake up, here is how I come alive. Will you run that, will you run that moment, please? Yeah, okay. 
Okay. So we'll, we'll probably get back to talk about that a little bit later here. But uh, again, like I said, if I want to get my wife sometime, go, are you playing that thing again? <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, I, uh, I grew up right here in South Carolina, down in the low country. And uh, ever since I was just a little kid, I've always wanted to be in the military just my thing. There are a number of military folks around, either out of Charleston or Savannah, probably some from here at Fort Jackson that would be on then U.S. Uh, Highway 17 traveling. My dad would pick some of them up sometime. Folks did a lot of hitchhiking back in those days, if you remember that. Don't do that so much these days. But, uh, and so I would get to see these folks in uniform. So my whole goal was to get a uniform. I wanted to be in the uniform. And so, again, I wanted to, wanted to serve the nation by serving in the military. And, um, and so, mentioning the uniform, you should see me when I first got my Boy Scout uniform. There's a picture of me grinning from ear to ear, and my wife managed to sneak that out every once in a while and give it to someone to see, see what he was like when he was a kid, you know? Um, but again, I, 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 I wanted to serve. And so, how did out of high school, I almost came directly into the Air Force right out of high school. And then there was a high school instructor who chatted with me and said, well, I was thinking that you'd go to college. Well, no one had really talked to me seriously about going to college at that point. But he chatted with me and he said, well, you know, you can go to college, you can still go in the military after going to college. And I took his advice and I started down applying for schools and I went to school at Tennessee State, Nashville, Tennessee. Didn't really know it at the time because I hadn't done my research. But when I got there, I discovered they had Air Force ROTC. And uh, I was, and it was mandatory because it was state school. And so I got into ROTC, got introduced to flying, and then the school had a flying program as well. Uh, and so I changed my major from mechanical engineering, which I was failing in miserably, <laughs> and then got into something that I really fell in love with, and that was aviation. And, um, and immediately my grade point average went up. My parents was a lot happier um, when I let them know that I was, uh, was in aviation or when they saw my grade point average. Uh, I also had my first flight ever in an airplane while I was there. It was a J3 Piper Cub, uh, and it was on a Saturday morning, and uh, the whole world opened up for me at that moment. Uh, with this uh, senior at, at Tennessee State who was in the aviation major took me out for this one. Um, so when I got back on the ground, I was all excited. I wrote a letter home. We didn't have email and text and all of those wonderful kinds of things that uh, can be enjoyed today. So I wrote a letter home and said, guess what? I, I got an opportunity to fly an airplane. And so I, uh, my parents, uh, particularly my mom, immediately sent the letter right back to me. Usually I didn't get one, to get a response that quick, but immediately I got one back. And she said, boy, I thought we sent you there to go to school. What are you doing flying airplane? You know? <laughs> I said, mom, I am in school. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm studying. I'm studying aviation. Um, and, and so, you know, they weren't particularly interested in me, particularly mom, because she thought that was a dangerous kind of business to be in. I wasn't particularly interested in me flying airplanes, but again, I fell in love with it. Went through Tennessee State, graduated from there, got my commission, came into the United States Air Force, went to flight school at, at Wings Air Force Base right outside of uh, Phoenix, Arizona. 
Now, before going to Arizona, I had never been any place other than the East Coast. You know, places where they have tall trees, lots of greenery, and moss, and those kinds of things. And then I arrived in Phoenix, Arizona, and I thought I was on the moon. These tumbleweeds, big desert, all of those kinds of things. Uh, immediately, I got homesick then for being wanted to be back here on, on the East Coast. After being there for a while, I got accustomed to the desert, you know, and that story about uh, when it's 110 degrees at dry heat, so you're not really hot, that's a lie. You feel really <laughs> hot when it's 110 degrees, trust me. Went through flight school there, and, and, and out of flight school, my next aircraft was my first combat aircraft was F-4 Phantoms. Went to George Air Force Base out in Victor, California, Victorville, California, which was more desert, and that's where I got my combat training in F-4 Phantoms out there. Shortly after that, I'm in survival school up in, uh, right outside of, well, in Spokane, Washington, and then from there to Vietnam. So I left for Vietnam in 1968, for Vietnam in 1968, matter of fact, it was on April the 4th, 1968, that might ring a bell for because that was the day Bobby King got shot. Mm -hmm. And so there was this turmoil in my head about where am I going? You know, should I be going to Vietnam or should I be staying here? The decision was made uh, as I toiled my way through the rest of the afternoon because I didn't hear about this until about mid-afternoon in San Francisco. I was in San Francisco with a group of my uh, pilot training buddies and, uh, and, and, and so we were commiserating Together. And so I did get on the aircraft <laughs> at about midnight that night and departed for, for Vietnam by way of Clark Air Base in the Philippines for a short layover, a couple of days, and then from there in, into the in country itself. I left from Clark and then landed in, in uh, Tunstan, which was the old Saigon. And, uh, and from there I made my way on up to the Nang, which is where I I, I flew in Da Nang uh, for 269 combat missions, 79 over North Vietnam, uh, and I wound up being there for a full year of 19, April 1968 to April 1969. Now, when I first got there, the rules of engagement was if you fly 100 missions over the North, you get to come home. So you're either in country for a year or flying 100 missions, whichever came first. So at about the 1st of November, I had about 70 missions. And then later on that month, President Johnson made a decision that we're no longer going to fly up north. They were trying to negotiate with the North Vietnamese about a peace, uh, a peace broking uh, situation. And maybe if you will remember, for those that can think back to there, if you can remember, they couldn't get the Vietnamese to the table. There was a decision about whether the table should be round or whether it should be, you know, rectangular, all of that kinds of nonsense. So anyway, we couldn't no longer fly up. No. Now, this is in November. I'm anticipating, okay, that I'm going to get the rest of my mission before this decision. I'll be home for Christmas, okay? Not so fast, because that decision was made. I got a few more missions. Like I said, I was right around 70. Ended up at 79 over the north, but I, instead of being home in December, I didn't get to come back home then until April of 1969. Out of, out of Vietnam, uh, back to the States for a short period of time, and then over to Clark Air Base, where I met some folks here today who were stationed at Clark Air Base. So I have to get the story straight right here now. <laughs> they didn't challenge me. No, I landed at Clark Air Base and uh, and, and I'd been there as I was in Vietnam. And so it was a, a great assignment. But here's the story. I didn't want to go to Clark Air Base. I can re remember very distinctly when this tech sergeant came and was going to tell me what my assignment was going to be. And he told me I was going to Clark Air Base. I'm a lieutenant. Okay. So I told the tech sergeant, no, 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 you got this all wrong. I'm not going to Clark. I'm going back to the war. Except this time I'm going to Thailand instead of being in country Vietnam. I'm going. A lot of my buddies were over in Thailand, places like Ubon, Udon, Karat, you know, places like that. And 
And so I was going to go back to the war. You know how it is when you're young, and unafraid, and all of those kinds of things. And, and so I was going to do that. And it was on a Friday. And uh, Sergeant and I are going back and forth, and he's trying to convince me that, yeah, you're going to Clark Air Base. And I'm telling him, no, I'm not. So he suggested to me, why don't you go home and think about this over the weekend? We'll talk about it on Monday. Sure enough, on Monday he came back, and we started in the dialogue again. And he said, okay, what would happen, and how would you explain it to your family if you went back and you got shot down? Well, I'd already lost you know, a number of my friends in the first tour I had. But you know what? I had never thought about Pig Newton being shot down. It was all of those other guys who were shot down. That's the way you think when you're young, you know? And so, it, it, you know, the, the bullets can catch all of them, but it's not going to catch you. I don't know why. I never necessarily thought that way, but that's the way I was thinking. But when he gave me that scenario, it stopped me in my tracks. And I decided, I've got to think. And so, sure enough, I took his assignment. I went to Clark Air Base in the Philippines, just like the sergeant told me I was going to do in the beginning, right? And um, so I went to Clark, and while I was there, got a chance to fly quite a bit, um, both at, in, in, in the Philippines as well up in Taiwan, several other places. But backstory is, back when I was at Tennessee State, uh, was the very first time I saw the United States Air Force Bell. I'd gone to this air show right out of, uh, right out of Nashville to all Seward uh, Air Force Base, and uh, I saw the phone the first time. They were flying F-100s at the time. And I saw these guys doing things with airplanes that I just couldn't imagine, okay? And when they landed, they taxied in all the formation, 100s, you know, parked side by side. All of the canopies came up together. All of the engines shut off at the same time. They stepped out in their wonderful blue Thunderbird uniforms. I saw that and I said, I grew up. That's what I okay. So that, that was my decision to try to fly with the Thunderbirds. So fast forward now again. I'm at Clark Air Base because there's certain requirements you got to meet. You got to have at least 1,000 hours of jet flight and trainer time, be in the Air Force for less than 10 years, be on conditional flying status, all of those. So when I started getting close to that point, I had you know, nine, 900 plus hours, I started putting my application together to apply for the team. And when it came the final time to, to, to the date, or getting close to that date for me to apply, I didn't quite have a thousand hours. So I was going to wait for a year. Except a, a gentleman uh, by the name of Elander who had just left the Thunderbird. He had friends at Clark, and he stopped at Clark on his way to Vietnam. And so they said, hey, you need to talk to Fig Newton. He wants to be on the Thunderbird so bad. And he landed up took time to chat. And he said, okay, we're not going to wait till you get a thousand hours. Go ahead and send your application in, and we'll see what happens. So he landed and gave me some advice, and I did that. My, my application went in. Thunderbirds called me a, you know, a couple weeks later and said, hey, congratulations. You made our semi finalist. I don't like that job. when we're finished, okay? Uh, anyway, uh, so I was invited to come back then and do an interview and travel with the team, and I was on cloud nine. Yeah. So I came back, did that. Uh, they said, okay, uh, go back, we'll call you. Uh, and let you know when you made the next press time. I get back to Clark, finally get a, a phone call from, uh, from Jerry Bolt that says, uh, sorry, Fig, you didn't make the finalists this time, be sure to fly next. A little bit of a doubt, but like, guess what? I had had the opportunity to go spend time with the Thunderbirds and even flew in the back seat of one of their airplanes. Nobody else at Clark had that opportunity. <clears throat> so I was still on cloud now. Okay. Year go by, and I say to myself, aha, I think I've kind of got this figured out now, so I'll fly again. So I, sure enough, I fly again, get the phone call, come back, travel with the team. They said, okay, good, you made the finalist, so I stayed, did some more work with them, and then they said, go home, we'll tell you later what you made. This. I went home, sure enough, I got a phone call again, and, you know, because of the time, this is about 2 o'clock in the Philippines, Jerry Bolt's about 4 o'clock back here in the United States, you see. 
Jerry called me again and says, hey, babe, this is Jerry. Uh, so sorry. You didn't make it this time. Uh, but be sure to apply again next year. Hmm, okay. So, in the meantime, I rotate back, because this is now 1973. I rotate back from Clark to Luke Air Base in, uh, in, in Phoenix, Arizona, on the opposite side from where I went to flight school. It was just as hot then when I got back as it was the first time. Except it was a different hot from when I was in the Philippines, okay? Because Philippines is very human, very much. Anyway, I get the I get the loop and the Thunderbird story continues. I, I, I initially I wasn't gonna fly. Then I got a call from a guy by the name of Steve Mish, who had made the team, we competed the year before, who had made the team the year before. He said, I haven't seen your application yet. He said, Yeah, I'm thinking about sitting out for the year and then try it again. He said, No, I think you need to put your application in. So I did put the application in. Sure enough, it goes in. I get the phone call. Hey, big, you made the semi finalists. I came back, flew with the team. Uh, they said, okay, you made the finalists. We went out and we did some more flying. And then they said, go home, we'll call you. <laughs> so I went home, continued to fly. I had one, at that time, I had one of the greatest, greatest jobs in the Air Force. I was a flight instructor at Air Force Phantom, the leading uh, jet uh, fighter aircraft in the inventory at the time. Okay? So I'm having fun. I'm an instructor pilot. And so one day, I'm out flying with a guy by the name of Chuck DeBellevue. DeBellevue had been in Vietnam as a backseater in F-4s because he was a navigator, and now he's upgrading to be a pilot. And he'd already gone through flight school, and now he's training in the F-4, and I'm supposed to be his instructor. So Chuck DeBellevue and I are out, and we are on, on, on the gunnery range at Luke Air Force Base. And I get a call from the squadron on the radio saying something like Phoenix 01, which is our call sign, Phoenix 01 or whatever our call sign was that day. Uh, return to base, you have a call from the Thunderbirds. I said, Chuck, I said, Chuck, I've had this call a few times before. I don't think there's any need to rush back to the base. Okay, so we didn't. We finished the mission. We finished the mission, and then we finally got back to the base. We landed, did our debrief, and with the maintenance folk, and now we're back in the squadron, and I'm deep deep in with, with Chuck of what he did right and what he did wrong, and what we'll do the next time we go out and all of that. And then I get this call from the front desk that says, hey, Newton, come to the front desk, you have a telephone call. So I tell Chuck, okay, I'll go take this one. So I went up uh, to get this phone call, and I said, who's the call from? He said, some guy from the phone call. I said, okay. So I walked in the next room, picked up the line, hi, this is Captain Big Newton. Hey, hey, this is Roger Perry uh, from the Thunderbirds, and congratulations, you just made the 1975 team. Oh. Now, I don't know exactly what happened after that. I'm sure I dropped the receive a jump, maybe that's how I or something like that, being so excited about the fact that I made the team. Um, by the, again, Jerry Bolt, when he was called me, he was one of the wingmen for the team. When Roger called me, he's the commander leader of so it was a slight difference. Well, I guess not. Um, so I came on the team, and this was in, this was in late 1974, so I became, came on the team and started the 75 team. came on the team initially was the narrator for the team, the voice and advanced person for the team, and then after that I flew in the slot position, that individual that's flying right behind the leader. I really wanted to keep an eye on all of those guys. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. That was, what I, that was the position I really wanted to fly, and sure enough, I got a Part of the moral of that story is, and I usually tell my younger audience, is just don't give up on your dream, okay? That's one of the reasons why when, uh, when B.J. Hill and myself wrote this book, and we wrote this book specifically focused on young people, namely those that are in junior and high school, and the title of the book is Living Your Dream, because that's exactly what has happened. Okay, I came in started living my dream. And I can tell you it's a pretty extraordinary dream, even until today. Because I never dreamt that I'd have the opportunity to be in Columbia and talking with all of you. So the dream continues. Okay. So, I flew with the Thunderbirds for uh, three years initially, left the team, uh, was in school at Norfolk, Virginia, got recalled back to the team because one of the guys had to have an operation on his right arm. So I was flying them, so I started off as a narrator. Went and flew the slot position, was called back to the team, 
decked out in blue on the right wing uh, as the right wingman with the team. So all total, I spent about three years and eight months with the team, which is a little bit longer than most folks ever get a chance to do. It's normally a two-year tour. So my big dream really came true, and now the question is, okay, Newton, what do you do now? Um, so from there, I left, went to Washington, D.C., and uh, worked as a con Air Force Congressional Liaison office, I, Officer. I worked with the House of Representatives uh, over on Capitol Hill, uh, which was another dream come true, because I had no idea about how laws were made in our country. But I got introduced to that, and it's amazing uh, how it all works, how the sausage is made. So, so I, I spent time in D.C., and then out of there, I, uh, I left, and I can remember my supervisor at the time, Paul McManus, say, okay, what do you want to do next? I said, I'm a flyer. <coughs> came into the Air Force, right? I'm a flyer. He says, okay. Uh, a few weeks later, he called me back in and says, okay, get ready. You're going to McDill to fly up 60. Oh, yes. So, you know, it's like dining, going to heaven, I suspect, you know, something like that. So... I left from D.C. in February when it was snowing and sleeting, got in my little Camry and started driving south, stopped in South Carolina, visited with my parents, and then got my car all washed up, got rid of all of that snow and salt and all of that off of my car, headed down to McDill. When I got there, I wanted to pay them for letting me fly instead of them paying me. It was so much. So, I got checked out in this brand new piece of equipment that was uh, the most extraordinary thing that I'd ever flown and I've done up until that point. And it's still a great airplane. Left from there, went spent uh, a tour in Korea. Out of Korea, I mean, uh, came back, went to Hill Air Force Base, uh, still flying up 16s. Um, I mean, it was a terrible job, but somebody had to do it. <laughs> uh, you know, I volunteered for all of those. Uh, out of Hill, I came back, spent some time in D.C., and that's when uh, uh, a good friend of mine says, okay, you, you need to come back to the Philippines. Phil, I mean, back to the Pentagon. Everyone has to pay your dues in the Pentagon, you know, if you go stay around the Air Force. So sure enough, I was called back uh, into the Pentagon and did uh, a tour of duty there, uh, and then out of there, I was sent to Vance Air Force Base in Enid, Oklahoma, to be the commander of a training. No, well, initially, I was going to be the base commander at a training base. We were training uh, pilots here, initial flight training for pilots. Well, the problem with that assignment was, particularly when I first got the assignment, was the base commander is a non flying job. Well, that wasn't what I do. I fly. So I told the personnel officer, I said, Greg, I think you got this all wrong. I'm not going to advance to do that. I, I'm going to apply to wing flash 16s because a lot of my buddies were getting assignments going back to be commanders of F-16 wings, I'd be the director of operations of F-16 wings, F-15s, or so what have you. I said, I'm not going to get any training made. So I said, I'm going down and talk to the general about this. So I walked down the hall and uh, went in to talk to my two-star uh, uh, boss, Al Logan, and I saw his administrative assistant. I said, is he in? She said, yes. I said, can I go see him? She said, yes. So I opened the door and walked in. As soon as he saw me, he started laughing so hard I thought he was going to fall off the chair. He said, I was wondering how long it was going to be before you'd be down here to talk about this assignment. You know? I go, oh, you really know about this, huh? He said, oh, yeah, it's great. They need you out of dance. You know, you go out there. You'll do great. We had that conversation, and I was still not convinced. I said, can I go see General Dugan? He's a three star. He said, sure. I walked down two doors, went into Dugan's office, his administrative assistant is there. I said, is he in? She said, yeah. Can I see him? Yes. I walked in. Dugan wore these kind of a half glasses when he was reading. He had a pile of stuff in front of him. He looked up and he said, yeah, hey, what can I do? But he had this kind of a high pitched voice. I said, sir, this assignment. Advance Air Force Base. Immediately he said, Yeah, you do great out there. You head out there, man, and everything's going to be wonderful. I'm going, Wait a minute. No one loves me anymore. You know, I used to be one of those guys that everybody loved. At least I thought until this point. So, sure enough, I packed up my stuff, and now I'm going to go across the country 
the vans, and I decided I'll go up and bring some friends and family. And so all the way, I start to drive out there, and I probably still got skid marks across the country, <laughs> not wanting to go. Okay, so I start driving out there, and I'm thinking, and I'm praying. What what is what is this all about? Yeah. Anyway. By the time I got to St. Louis, I was talking with someone about St. Louis a little bit earlier. I was going to stay the night over at Scott Air Force Base, right outside of St. Louis. By the time I got there, I made up my mind. I went, okay, if this is what they want me to do, if they want me to go be a base commander, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to be the best base commander they've ever seen. That was my goal. And sure enough, I got up the next morning, got in my car, drove through Kansas, stopped and visit with a farmer on a combine who was, who was uh, gathering wheat. And I knew a little bit about farming since I'd grown up on one here in South Carolina, nothing near that big. But uh, I stopped in and chatted with him for a little bit, made my way all the way over to Enid, Oklahoma. Walked in, reported to the commander, and said, I'm ready to go. And uh, sure enough, I did. So what I was really responsible for, it's kind of like being the mayor of a town, I suspect. I've never been a mayor before, but I'm responsible for all the logistics and the infrastructure at the base. What we call it was roads and commodes. That's what I was responsible for. <laughs> so one of those breaks they call Big Newton, I be sure that you get space. And don't let one that happen to the commander's house because then I really have to get it. Anyway. So I have all of these young college graduates coming in to go to flight school. And I said, okay, guess what? And I was the, one of the commanders who we talked to when they first arrived. And I said, here's the deal. My responsibility is to be sure that you get everything you need while you are here to be successful in flight school. I'm going to get you a room. I'm going to do all of those other things. I said, it's the one thing, it's only one thing I will not do, okay? I'm not going to help you get a girlfriend. That's it. I just want to come to All right? So the agreement, I said, if you want to go to the club, and a lot of folks were worried about the Austin's Club and whether young lieutenants would tear it up, kind of like what I did when I was a clock in the or something like that. Uh, I, and so, you know, I told him, I said, okay, why are you on this page? You can do whatever you want. For instance, on a Friday night, if you want to go to the club, if you want to tear it down, good. Go ahead and tear it down. Just be sure to leave me enough money so I can go downtown and have somebody rebuild it on Monday. That's all. Those are the rules. One of my folks came to me, one of my, my deputy commanders. You must be crazy. You can't tell lieutenants that. They'll do exactly what you told them to do. No one ever tore it down. We had a lot of fun. The lieutenants had fun. I had fun. And not all of them. But most of them were right. Okay? So I did that for uh, a, about a year. And then I got a call from the command saying, hey, how would you like to be a wing commander? Yeah, I'm really interested because a wing commander is why. Okay? But it was, you got a flat name of Joe Oak. I said, sure, I'd love to do that. Anyway, um, but the story is when they asked me to move from being a base commander, to go be a wing commander. I was having so much fun being a base commander, the very thing I didn't want to go and do, that I didn't really want to leave the job right at that moment. I was really enjoying what I was doing. So the moral of that story for me was, hey, don't try to guide your career. Now, I know a lot of folks who would say that, well, that's your crazy thinking. This Just let the system work. And if they tell you to go to Kunsan career, then do it. Uh, they tell you to go to being, uh, uh, in it, Oklahoma, advance Air Force Base, go do it. There's no place you go, you're going to be there forever. You're just going to be there for a while. And in my case, only two years. So, so I took over to be the wing command and went back to flying again. I was flying T-38s and T-37s. Did that for about a year, and then I got another call that says, okay, you're going to move from Vance to, to Randolph Air Force Base in Oklahoma. I mean, in uh, Texas, the premier base and the training command. I went down and did that for a while. And then I got another phone call that says, okay, it's time for you to come back to the tactical side of the house and I'll send you off to Holloman Air Force Base. Oh, by the way, this is a guy by the name of Mike Lowe. I've got this special assignment I want you to go do. What is that, sir? Well, you've heard of F-117, right? Self-fighter? Yes, sir. Well, 
we're going to bring them out of hiding in front of them. We're going to bring them to Holloman Air Force Base. Your responsibility is to go out there and make all of that happen. Wow. Wow. So now I go out and I get all checked. I go home. I get all checked out in the F 117 Delta Flyer to fly that. But at Holloman, they had F 15. Lowe said, oh, while you're at Holloman, get checked out in the F 15. And it was also, whoa, gee whiz, now you're really talking. So I'm flying the F-15, <coughs> I'm flying the T-38 because it's a companion aircraft to the, to the F-117 stealth fighter. And I'm flying the F-117 stealth fighter. It just doesn't get any better than that right now. Okay, it just doesn't get any better. So sure enough, we moved all of those F-117s out of, out of hiding out in Area 54, 50, 51. Out of Area 51, a lot of folks have heard about that. And we brought them down to New Mexico. They had already been in the war. and. Uh, in, in the desert, but we were having a great time. And then out of there, I would got another call from Lowe that says, okay, it's time for you to go do another assignment. So I went to special operations at Tampa headquarters at Tampa Air Force Base, I mean, at um, McDill Air Force Base in Tampa. And so it was just another boring assignment and where I just went and worked with SEAL Team 6 and uh, Delta Force and commandos out of, out of, uh, out of uh, um, Eglin and uh, the other base there in Florida. Uh, been some places all around the world. If I tell you much more about that, I'll have to shoot you, so I won't. <laughs> but it was another extraordinary assignment. Uh, and then from there, I was called one morning, one Saturday morning to be exact, by the chief of staff of the Air Force and said, hey, big, I'm working on some assignments for next, next summer. Um, and I'd like you to come up and be the assistant vice chief of the Air Force, which was, and to get promoted to the third star, which was uh, the number three position in the Air Force. So I hung up the phone, turned to my wife, and said, and she knew that I, being in special operations, you get these strange phone calls various times of the night or the day or whatever. And uh, she said, um, so what was that all about? I said, that was the chief. And she another assignment, because I was thinking I was going to retire out of that job at the gym. Uh, he wants me to come to Washington to be the assistant vice chief, and he'll, they'll promote me to my third star. He just looked at me. And you believe that? <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm wondering, was the chief really on the line, or was it one of my friends pulling my leg or something? I almost want to go back and pick up the phone and call. I said, Chief, did you just call me and give me a message or something like that? Well, it was true. We did leave from there, went for Washington, got my, my third stop pin on, and um, while getting my third stop pin on, Fogelman, who was the chief of staff at the time, he hired me. He got up and says, ladies and gentlemen, this is a great day. It's particularly a great day for the Newton family. You know, Fig is from a little town called Ridgeland, South Carolina. And I can guarantee you there isn't anybody in Ridgeland today because they're all sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> that was almost true. That's how big Ridgeland is. Uh, and he said, now, I know Fig thinks he's going to be your traditional assistant vice chief. But you know, the Air Force is going to have its 50th anniversary in two years. This is 95. In 1997, the, 50th, the Air Force is going to have its 50th anniversary. Big Newton is going to be responsible for the 50th anniversary. Now, that's the first time I've heard that. So <laughs> he hadn't told me that, but he invited me to be the assistant vice chief. Anyway, long story short, it was a great year in 1997. Except that in March of 1997, I'm walking past it, well, just before March of 1997, I'm walking past his office. He said, Big, come in here. I need to talk with you. So I go, OK. He wants to help me with the 50th anniversary, which they had been a lot of that along the way, you know. Uh, so he called me into his office, closes the door, and I said, okay, this is really bad. I'm going to really be in trouble here. And he turns to me and he said, just want to let you know that the secretary and I sent your name downstairs to uh, set death for you to be, to replace Billy Bowles, which is the commander of air training down at Bethlehem. And you get your full stop. Now I'm stuck. I don't even know what to say. And I go, gee, uh, I, I don't know what to say. He said, don't say anything. It's already done. So he said, you can't tell anybody except your wife, Emily. 
And so I left from there. And now I really, you know, all of these crazy things start running through your head. And I, I don't know what to do with this. You know? Sure enough, a few weeks later, the orders come through. I move from there. I go to San Antonio, Texas, which is where we had been stationed before. And I take over the command, uh, air training command, where we had like 65,000 uh, uh, folks plus 14 or so thousand civilian and a uh, whole bunch of airplanes. And I still get to fly your planes, too. That was the exciting part. I still get to fly your planes. Uh, and because I was responsible for all of the flight training, including F-15s, F-16s, F-16s uh, were being trained out of Luke Air Force Base, F-15s in down Panama <coughs> City, at Tendall Air Force Base, B-52s, 135s, all of that, plus all of the training aircraft. So I got an opportunity to fly all of those airplanes in my last assignment. It goes up fantastic. So I finished up there in 2000, retired. My wife and I get in the car, and we decided on the way back to the East Coast, we would stop in New Orleans. I'd never been in New Orleans, just on a vacation. And so we were going to stop there. But we drive out of Randolph Air Force Base. My wife turns to me and says, well, buddy, you've got us in a great fix now. We are homeless, all of our furniture on some truck someplace, and you don't even have a job. <laughs> That's how I started my retirement from the year. Anyway, let me stop there, because uh, you can tell right off that I can tell these stories for a long period of time. Because I didn't enjoy it at all, spending 34 and a half years in that city. Let me stop there and see whether you have any questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so very much. Well, <laughs> the service to the nation is certainly my honor. This is what I've always wanted to do. And, uh, and, and, and fortunately, I had the opportunity. So that's certainly my Next question. Yes, ma'am. Did you ever have political aspirations? Uh, for a very short period of time, until I had that experience in Washington, that I decided <laughs> this is not something I can do. I don't, I don't, you get me wrong, I, you know, we, we live in a democratic society and, and the political process of that institution is absolutely fantastic, just not what big Newton can do or, or want to do, but for those who want to do it, I support them 100%. Yeah, so thanks. Yes, sir, then I'll come. Back to your F-4 days in combat, yeah. the F-4 flew many types of missions, what was Never left Clark. Never left Clark. No, they had just supported seven 
as well as then there was Fifth Air Force up at Yokota in Japan. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, did you have a um, have a problem flying, like being in the Delphi or have an engine failure? Um, um, I, I'll tell you about the engine failure, but uh, um, whether you have a problem flying, uh, that's almost an interesting question to try to answer because it kind of depends. You see, uh, I got shot up a few times in Vietnam, but always had the up. I never had to jump out. Like I've never jumped out of it. F4 fan, it was just a very sturdy, big, um, you know, it had those two big uh, GE J79 engines on it, and it was terrific. So I, I've gotten shot up a few times, but all this was able to make it back to, to the name, and so I never got shot down. Um, with reference to an engine failure, I never had an engine failure while I was flying the F4, but I did have an engine failure when I was with the Thunderbirds flying, uh, flying T38. We were at uh, uh, an airfield, a civilian air show, and we were in Columbus, Ohio. And we had just come off of doing the trail roll, and we're coming back around to do another maneuver. And I, I, I saw the birds as they were coming. And sure enough, one or two or how many of them went right into my left engine. And I, I heard it as soon as it went in, the airplane just kind of popped. Looked down, the engine is lining down. I just kind of eased out of formation, called the leader, said that Thunderbird 1, this is Thunderbird 4, just took a bird strike and lost my left engine. His next comment to me was, can you land that thing? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and we're, we're making a left hand turn, the runway is back over here. I go, yes sir, I can, I can make the runway. So they just went through, did a maneuver without me, I slowed down, put the gear down, came back around, landed the aircraft, everybody was happy. Yes, sir. What was your most pucker factor flying? <laughs> uh, um, anybody who tells you when they're engaged in war that they never got scared, don't believe. Okay. Um, there was a, a, a couple of different times when 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 you're out there flying, and particularly you're flying at night, um, and you see all of this flak coming at you, and and the way. The, 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 the bullets out of these various guns. They had basically 37 millimeter, 57 millimeter guns that are firing at you down there. But every fifth bullet is a tracer, okay? So you see these red streaks. And if you're watching a movie or something, every once in a while you see this. <clears throat> these red streaks coming at you. So there are two stories. On my very first mission, uh, you know, I get in country and you get your orientation done, and, uh, and 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 now it's time to go out and fly. Well, on the schedule, my very first mission is in North Vietnam. Now, I really thought, you know, the first mission I'd be in South Vietnam a little bit, you know, just in case. <laughs> oh no, no, not for you, Pygmy. You you go to North Vietnam, and I'm flying with a gentleman. I was a lieutenant. He was a major. A guy by the name of Rex Hammond. Now, why would I always remember Rex Hammond? Because he took me on that very first mission, okay? I'm flying in Rex Hammond's back seat, and um, we go up into what called Route Pack 2. We're going to hit a bridge that day. So we go up there, Rex dives in uh, to hit this bridge, and he pulls off, and he said, did you see that flak? <coughs> and I said, what flak? He said, you see all those little puffs and smokes all around us there? Yeah, he said, that's flak. I got scared. Let me talk. Let me talk. Uh, and then, like I said, there were other times at night when you're there and you're rolling in on a target, and they are just—they may not know exactly where you are because they may not have you locked up on radar. But most of the time, down in the lower packs, they didn't. But they can hear that those two big engines on that F4, um, and and so they're just firing, barrage kind of firing, and it's all around, you, you know. And so that's kind of. <clears throat> yes, sir. Have let, let, let me grab this gentleman, then I'll be with you. Yes, sir. I had a uh, question over there based on personal experience. I was in a convoy once. It was in the Army in Vietnam. We were going from Play Coup down to Quinn Yon. The convoy came under attack before he locked his fire, and they called in the ground troops, coordinating the defense, called in tactical air support. Mm -hmm. Two panels showed up. I don't know. They didn't come out of nowhere as far as I was concerned. I've never been so glad to see an American aircraft in my whole life. <laughs> Thank you. I know you weren't flying that. I never understood, because I came home from Vietnam, 
like out of the Army. I never understood how the pilots knew where we were on the ground and where they dropped their bombs. Yeah. Um, they told me it was PRC 25 radio, I guess, called and back later still coming. But I never, they, they did pop some smoke on the target. Right. Beyond that, I didn't know how the pilots who were flying several thousand feet over the terrain knew where to respond to drop the bombs. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. how that operation worked? Yeah. I want to thank you again. Uh, you're quite welcome. And thanks for your service as well. Uh, yeah, there, there are two ways we, we did that. One would be with a ground tactical person would call us and say, hey, we'd be uh, closer to support. We would go in for that. But that one, most of the time, just as you mentioned, we would ask them to pop smoke, which way, where the enemy is located from the smoke, and where the friendly is located, okay? And then if the friendlies say, are to the south, and the, the enemy is to the north, we want to hit the enemy parallel to the friendlies. We don't want to fly over the over the friendlies in any way, either heading over them or coming over them from the opposite. We want to fly parallel to them. So if you pop the smoke and said, my hit 50, 50 kilometers or 50 meters, I'm sorry, 50 meters to the north of my smoke, that's where we're going to aim because that's where the answer is. Okay, so that's that's how that's how we would do it. <laughs> the other way we would do it is we would have what we call a foreign air controller or FAC. This individual is flying a slow aircraft like a Cessna 172, but it was a propeller type aircraft. And they would have rockets on that had phosphorus in it. And it, they would fire that, hit a position where the enemy is, and tell us to hit his smoke or hit 50 meters one way or 100 meters the other way from that smoke. That's how we knew where to target. Yeah. So the F 4s that came to our aid, would they have been land based in Vietnam? Or the yeah, they would be. They, they, if, if they came to you in Vietnam, that probably would have been. Very seldom that we have folks out of Thailand that would hit closer to support. Yeah. Yeah. They were normally up north uh, or, or up, up someplace, maybe over in Laos, and on the Ho Chi Minh Trail and, and all of that. That's where those folks were. Did they just fly around uh, waiting for a call from the ground? To... Um, they're, they're a lot, they, they could be that way. So Because sometimes we'll take off, and a couple of controllers up there, Moonbeam was one of them that quickly comes to my mind, or uh, other forward air controllers might be there, and they'll ask you, says, okay, come into the area and hold, you know, 30 miles north of us or, or whatever. You can get on the TACAM radio and hold there, and then they'll call you in by call sign. Coming out of the Nang, most of the time, we were gunfighters, so we'd be gunfighter, whatever, gunfighter six, uh, and so on. And so they would call us in, or we may be on a mission going someplace else, and then troops um, come under attack, and they'll divert you from that mission to come in and, and help us support the troops. So there's several different ways to do that. Yes, sir. How does a pilot avoid missiles? And what do you think of Top Gun Maverick? <laughs> <laughs> the way you avoid missiles is very careful. <laughs> now, we, we, had a, we had a defensive maneuver for, for most of the time when we were in Vietnam. They had what we call SAM-2s. That was the, 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 the model of the missile at which the Russians had given to the Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese. And so when you see the missile coming up, okay, we're, we're stacked in a formation in, with the F-4s where we're not very close together. We're like 1,500, 2,000 feet apart. And you're looking around all the time for these missiles. Plus, you had a warning signal inside the cockpit when a missile comes off because of its radar guidance, you would know then that you got a missile coming from, you know, your right three o'clock or your left nine o'clock or whatever, or wherever the missile happened to be coming from. And so you pick up the missile vis visually, visually. So the missile is coming up, and as it's coming to you, then you want to turn it and you, you kind of aim at it. This is all you know, kind of an eyeball in this whole thing. And you wait until the missile like commits on you, and then you dive down real hard into the missile but diving down. And now the missile can't pull enough G's to make that turn. And so when it pulls a certain amount of G's, then it goes ballistic, and it just explodes out of there someplace. But that's how we avoid uh, That was our maneuver for avoiding uh, the missile. It got very tricky down there at, at times, because you watch it as it's coming out there. You know, most of our, when I was over there, most of our folks got shut down, either by ground fire uh, of the guns or uh, of the missiles. And so you're watching, and at night this thing lights up. I mean, it's a, 
we call it the telephone pole that's on fire and it's coming right at you. And you dive down and miss the thing and you'll see it go over your head and then explode. Yes, sir. Did you, on that note, did you work with any of the wild weasel missions to take out the sound? I mean, you, you weren't flying wild weasels. No, no, I was not flying wild. But did you work with those guys? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and and the weasels, um, a lot of them flew um, 105s. Okay, F105s, and then a little later on they flew F4s. It's a different model. But the weasels had this capability to track radar that's that's controlling these missiles, and if the radar was emitting, they could pick them up. And then they would go in low and fast and put a bomb right on those. And so, right on the, on that radar. If you took the radar out, then the missiles are not going to do very much. And, and the guns could not lock on the missiles. So the weasels would usually be out in front of you by 30 seconds, a minute or so in front of you to take those out. And then you're in the hit the bomb. So if we were going for a specific target, particularly up around on the line, you always had to put the weasels. Sir. Good afternoon. Sir. I didn't do it. Whatever. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, with 30 plus years of service and four stars, you've got a lot of leadership experience, uh, obviously. And I heard two tidbits that I'll take away. One is uh, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. In other words, persistence or grit is one leadership uh, lesson we can take from what you've said. And the second one is let or trust the process. Let the let the uh, system work and trust the process. Do you have any other little tidbits of leadership that you'd like to uh, share with us based on your uh, vast experience, sir. Thank you. What is your name again? Barry Fester. Yeah, yeah, you just put me right on the spot, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, yes, I'd, I'd be happy to share uh, maybe two. Okay. Uh, my experience has been in working Maybe three. Number one, let them do their job. Okay? And and out of that came a couple of philosophies for Pig Newton the way I tried to lead. One of them was I want to ensure that every member of my organization, a full team member, and you gotta make them feel that way. Okay. The way I help to make them feel that way. No one in this organization is more important than anybody else. No, not me, not you, not you, not anybody. And the reason is, we all may have different jobs, but because I happen to have four stars and you have one stripe, doesn't mean I'm more important than you. It just means I'm at a different level. Because if you don't get your job as a one striper done, then I'm not going to succeed. So we can all do this together as a team. So my responsibility was to ensure that that young individual felt like they was as much of a team member here as I was. Okay, so that was one. The other one is I have to create an environment where they can feel that. And that's what I work hard at doing. I work really hard at that. So what, what kind of techniques did I use to do that? Here's a couple. If I was having um, a big formation, and there were times, particularly when I was a four-star, I was traveling all the time, so there's all the 13 bases that I was responsible for. I had very little time with my home team. But when I was home, I would have a big get together in one of the aircraft hangars or something like that. And I would give them some update on what was going on in the Air Force, what was going on in the command, just so that they would be up to speed of what was going on. But while we're doing that, and we, we tried to also, I'd get up and talk for a bit, maybe some of my other senior leaders can talk as well, various subjects. But then we try to have a little social after that. And I kind of look around the room, and I wanted to see the person out there who felt like I am the least person here. Because they need to use the field that And I'd walk around the room, and I'd find that individual. And I would go, hi, what's your name? Hi, my name is Dave Newton. Where are you from? I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. Guess what? I know a lot about Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> so we just kind of break the ice in this chat with them. And they go and they say, you know what? That four star took the time to come and say hi to me. Okay. So I 
did little tricks like that. Here's another one. I would be, uh, I may go home for lunch, and I'm in my car, and the car had your language on it. Okay, but, and your, your colonel has got the eagle to the front on it. I got fortunate enough to get four stars, and I find those times I have four stars. So here's this young man, he's meeting me. Now, why this has always been a problem, I don't know. But as soon as they see that car, immediately they turn and want to go someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> they do not want to see whoever is driving that car. And so I would just, and also when they see the car, if they just, you know, if someone who's not concerned about that, they walk along and they salute, you know, salute the rank, I salute back, and everybody went back to thereafter. But for the individual who kind of looks down or turn and go the other way, I stop. And I said, hey, go be. <laughs> Sir, I don't need a ride. <laughs> so I would have them get in. And I said, where do you work? Sir, I work in finance. What's, what's the number to your office? They give me the number. I call that number. They say, hey, guess what? I've got Airman Barry here. <laughs> and he or she are not in any trouble, so don't worry about them. But they're not going to be back at work right now because they're going to be with me for just a little bit. And so don't worry about Oh, yes, sir. So they hang up. Now, this person is sitting there going, what is going on? <laughs> what, what is he doing to me? Yeah. So then I go down to my building, cross my car, say, come on, I'm introducing my staff. Take them up, introduce them to my administrative assistant, my vice commander, whoever else is in the office. Then I take them into my office. And I say, okay, see that seat right there? Yeah, that's my seat. Go sit there. They go sit there. And then I pull up a seat and I sit on the other side. And I say, okay, now, tell me what's going on on this day. And immediately kind of goes, no. Uh, <laughs> <it's> okay. <laughs> just, just tell me, what, what do you think? What do I need? To, you're the commander. Now tell me what would you fix. You'd be surprised. All kinds of wonderful tidbits come out of that. <laughs> Well, sir, I really didn't like the parking at the BX. I go up there, and all you generals have got these signs up there for you, but no, there are no signs for airmen. You know. I go, okay, guess what? As soon as you get to be a general, there'll be a sign there for you. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this, what this really means is you have to work to get those signs up there. Uh, so it's all kinds of little tricks to the game. But guess what? When Barry leaves, and I take Barry back to his office, can you imagine what happened? Barry tells the first 1,000 people he sees, <laughs> guess what happened to me today? <laughs> so, that's, that's just... Yes, sir? Uh, when you were in the Philippines... I was... I was uh, did you ever encounter Vision of Davis Jr.? Because he was the commanding officer yeah. there for, for he, a period of time. He I was. I was wondering what <laughs> his experience was with him. Yeah. And also, uh, Kitsi West. Uh, that was a, a bit ahead of my time, yeah. Okay. Uh, Davis was there. He was the commander of the 13th Air Force, which was mentioned here a little bit earlier. Yeah. So he was the commander there. But I got to know General Davis personally uh, uh, some years later. Uh, and uh, the Westmoreland, I'm not familiar with that connection to Clark Air Base. I did uh, General Westmoreland was in Vietnam. But, but, but uh, yeah, but, be, but before me, General, General, General Davis was there. I remember when, this was many years after he retired, that uh, they, the, the government presented him with his four star. Mm -hmm. And he was aging by this point, okay? Um, Bill Davis, by the way, for those who may not know, Bill Davis uh, was, the, was the first African American general in the United States Air Force, okay? And Bill Davis was the individual that led the Tuskegee Airmen during World War II. Uh, um, in, in Europe, okay? Trained at, down at Tuskegee during the Tuskegee experiment, uh, took the outfit uh, uh, to Europe and, and led them up. So when they were presenting Davis with his uh, fourth star, they, again, he was aging by now. Davis stood up. 
just as straight as he could be. Walked up to the mic, thanked the president, who was President Clinton at the time, and said, if it wasn't for the United States Air Force, I wouldn't be here today. And he went on to tell the story. Just an extraordinary individual who really loved this country. Uh, was a terrific leader. Uh, because their mission when they were in World War II was to escort the bombs, okay? And they finally got into P-51s, they had a couple different airplanes before they got into P-51. But Davis's order was, others who had been escorting the bombers would, when they saw an enemy fighter, everybody wants to become an ace if you're a fighter pilot, me included, okay? So many of them would break away from escorting the bombers and go try to chase down an enemy uh, German fighter and shoot it down so that they could become the big guy on the block and become an ace. Davis's order was, anybody that breaks formation without me telling you to do so, I'll call on you. You're going to stay with those bombs until they get the target and back. And that's the kind of thing. And they never lost the bomb. That's right. <coughs> extraordinary, extraordinary. Yes, sir. General, did you ever have uh, much encounter with the B-52 guys? Some. Um, Some. I have a friend in Charleston, Johnny Mack, that was a uh, B-52 pilot. Yeah. In, yeah. In Vietnam. yeah. That's a pretty good story. So, well, I, I escorted B-52s when they would go and, and, and drop bombs, particularly up north. Um, and let me tell you, um, they, they used to call them the arc light missions. And uh, when a B-52 comes through and they're going to drop two or three hundred, five hundred pound bombs. I don't know what happens down below, but it's a heck of a rain of bombs going down as you're sitting there watching this thing. Is that believe? Another short story about B-52. So <coughs> this is uh, when I was stationed in the Pentagon. My uh, my boss there was a B-52 pilot, and I'm a fighter pilot. And he said, "Fig, you need to learn something about big airplanes. So go out in the field and learn something about big airplanes." I said, well, if you're going to learn about big airplanes, why not go and learn about B-52s? So I went to Minard Air Force Base up in, uh, up in Minnesota, and this is in, like, September. My that's North Dakota. North Dakota, I'm sorry. <laughs> North Dakota, you're, you're correct. Yeah, why not Minard? Yes. Correct. Why not Minard? But anyway, I, I went there, and it's, like, late September, and it's snowing when I get there. Okay. So I go, ooh. They probably anticipate this, my boy from South Carolina, and it's <laughs> you know. But I got there, and they said, okay, I was a colonel at the time. She said, okay, colonel, we're going to take you out to fly a mission with us tomorrow. We're going to brief today, so we're briefing. And the aircraft mm -hmm. commander says, okay, we'll take off. We're going to take off with the tanker. Tanker takes off first. We'll take off next. We'll go up. I'll have the co pilot fly for a bit so he can get some training uh, or air refueling, and then I'll call you in. I said, okay, fine. And I noticed the rest of the crew, they kind of started kind of a snickering at that point. I didn't pay too much attention to it, because I didn't know exactly what it meant. I said, okay. Anyway, the next day we go out, we get all ready, we get in the airplane, we taxi out. Sure enough, the tanker takes off, you know, lots of noise, lots of smoke. B-52 takes off, lots of noise, lots of smoke. We get airborne, and the co-pilot is up there, and he's trying to get in position to get fuel from this KC-135. Well, again, I've had quite a bit of experience flying fighters and, you know, I'm flying F-4s or F-16s or whatever. You just slide right up under this thing, pull right up. <coughs> they lock right in, you get your fuel and you're off. I'm, I'm wondering what's taking this co that's so long to get this B-52 in position. Now it's the hidden time to come up. I go up there, I grab a hold of this beast, and the instructor pilot is telling me, he says, okay, sir, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate the first one. So he pulls it out, he puts it right in there. And the controls on this thing, I mean, it, it's moving all over the cockpit, it, at least in my view. It's moving all over the cockpit. When you're flying a fighter, if you move the controls out.